Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Sebastián Galarza Suárez. I am the Executive Director uh, of the Centro de Movilidad Sostenible. And today I will talk a little bit more about the experience of Santiago de Chile deploying electric buses over the course of the last few years. Uh, a little bit about CMS. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that is based in Santiago de Chile. Our mission is to support efforts to decarbonize the transport sector in the Latin American Caribbean. And we do so working both on research and outreach, um, but also helping countries uh, with the promotion and the design of effective public policies in this space. We do this by working with international partners and bringing the best international experiences to the country, to the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, making sure to adapt these to the local context and the local needs to make sure that these efforts are successful. A little bit of context around Santiago de Chile. Santiago de Chile is one of the largest cities in Latin America and the Caribbean. It has about 7.3 million inhabitants and it is surrounded by the Andean mountain range, which causes a number of problems in terms of air quality in the city, notably during the winter months where uh, added pressure leads to an excessive amount of pollution concentrated during uh, across the city. And this is one of the main drivers for the introduction of more stringent emission standards, but also new technologies in the transportation sector like battery electric vehicles and buses. The public transportation system is very important in Santiago de Chile. We have over 5.7 daily um, public users of the transportation system, 3.7 million uh, trips conducted in the public transportation system that is made up of a metro system, but also buses. And buses provide a very important uh, mode for movement across the city. The fleet currently is about 6,600 to 6,800 buses currently on the streets. And it's a system that has gone substantial changes over the course. So what we see here, for example, is the number of buses on the streets of Santiago over the course of time. And what we see here is that deregulation policies that began in the 1970s led to an increase or a substantial increase, almost doubling or more of the size of the public bus fleets here in Santiago de Chile. And over the course of time, there were processes to deregulate, to regulate, sorry, the number of buses on the streets, leading to a reorganization called Transantiago, which was launched in 2006, 2007, and which lasted through 2019. This model was made up of six operators covering all the needs of the city in terms of public transportation. Now, the way that this would function is that private operators would be contracted by the government and operators would have contracts of about 10 years for fleets of around 1,000 buses and the operators were in charge of operating the buses as well as the terminals that were needed for the operation of the cities. And this is the system that has been in place over the course of the last, uh, over the, the last uh, 20 years, almost 20 years. Uh, even though, even so, historically, Chile has had a strong focus on, of incorporating new vehicle technologies into the, into the public transportation sector. And in that regard, in 2018, Santiago de Chile was the first city in Latin America to introduce Euro 6 as the standard for all new public transportation buses in the city. In order to ensure uh, that Santiago had the best quality of buses operating in the city, and in order to also uh, incentivize a better energy consumption of these buses, in 2018, uh, we helped um, the Ministry of Transportation develop a Santiago cycle. And this urban bus cycle is the cycle that is used to type approve all new buses that are coming into the system in Santiago. And this measure allows us to 
more accurately quantify the energy consumption of buses, but also their emissions profiles. And this is very important in terms of incentivizing the right technologies and also doing this in a way that is technology neutral in terms of competing for less energy consumption overall. At the same time that we were implementing these initiatives, a number of electric bus pilot projects began in Santiago de Chile starting in 2013, which have rapidly extended over the course of the first few years of implementation of these programs. And this led us to not only better understand how these buses operate, but also create more interest by different vehicle providers of entering the market and providing buses, electric buses, for public transportation operations. These pilots were also accompanied by a number of training programs that were focused on training personnel on a number of different things, not only chauffeurs and drivers learning how to drive more effectively and more efficiently electric buses, but also understanding all the dynamics around the new electric bus system, which includes chargers, the buses, and the whole ecosystem of activities. And these pilots led for, gave, gave us this first opportunity to better introduce these new concepts to different actors and to also start to certify most of the actors that were needed to be able to operate these buses in the first place. At the same time, a number of new innovative models, financial models, models allowed for the rapid scaling of these activities, going from small pilot projects of one to two buses to operations that led to 100 buses and large-scale deployments working with different actors. And the way that these work, in most cases, was that you had a financial arm, in this case, for example, NG, that supported a local operator, in this case, STP and Buses Bule, to buy electric buses from a different provider, in this case, Utong, to include in their fleet provision requirements for the public transportation system. Similarly, Metbus, for example, another operator in Santiago de Chile, partnered with Enelex, a utility firm as well, to support the financial scheme with BYD to deploy over 100 buses in Santiago de Chile. And these two operations, these first two operations of 200 buses at a time, led to the first scale deployments of electric buses in Latin America and the Caribbean and have substantially contributed to not only emissions reductions but to spur what we have seen consolidated over the course of the last few years when now we have over 2,500 buses operating on the streets of Santiago de Chile, 2,500 electric buses. Now, as I mentioned previously, it was very important to develop a competitive and transparent market for electric buses. And in this regard, the Ministry of Transport here in Chile it has a very strong vehicle lab that certifies and controls all the vehicles that are entering the market. And in that case, together with the Transantiago Urban Drive Cycle that we developed for the ministry and for the city, we are able to test all the vehicles that are coming into the market and we can calculate the range and energy consumption based on the demands of Santiago de Chile, not the demands of the supplier or the testing schemes that the supplier may have for those autonomies and for those ranges and for those consumptions, energy consumptions that sometimes are mentioned. So this was a very important aspect of the introduction of these new, new buses because at the same time, the new tendering schemes provided points based on energy efficiency. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, how going back to the financial model that let this happen, and this is with a little bit more detail in terms of what this looks like, but basically, again, we have the national government that, together with subsidies, has uh, uh, subsidies, supplies subsidies to the Ministry of Transportation for the operation of the public transportation system. And here, what the, public, the Ministry of Transportation does is create a concession contract with the operator, Metbus here, and that concession allows Metbus to negotiate with an LX and to BYD the procurement of the electric buses. And in this case, what happens is that the financial administration agency handles all the subsidies, collects all the fares for the public transportation system, and pays directly 
the financial actor, in this case an Alex, and discounts from that payment, or sorry, from the discounted payment to the operator, it pays the utility company. The, the operator receives the net amount that is collected uh, aside from the capital costs of their buses. And you have an operator, uh, sorry, you have the bus provider here that provides the services, including the maintenance of the buses to be able to operate in the system. Um, again, this model has been replicated at scale, and this is the model that we're seeing also being implemented in other cities of Latin America. And this has also been done in conjunction with uh, extensive investments in infrastructure. And Chile, for example, has now, uh, now has not only uh, the largest uh, city fleet outside of China, but also some of the largest electric terminals for buses in Now, in 2021, we had around 784 electric buses in operation. And then we had the first tender for the public transportation system that included electric buses. And this tender was very important because it included both the option for operators to choose between diesel or electric. And over half of the buses that entered the market were electric. And that has led to uh, now we have around 2,500 electric, electric buses in service, which correspond to around 30% of the fleet. But also right now we're in the course of conducting our first tender that is exclusive to electric buses for the public transportation system. Now, another aspect that is very important to be able to support these policies is that Chile also has a very ambitious national electric mobility strategy. And this strategy includes public transportation as one of its pillars, and in doing so has set a, uh, a, um, has set a target of electrifying all new buses entering the market by 2035. And this is similar also to the target that is set for new light and medium duty vehicles, but also important given Chile's uh, strong mining industry, for example, and the use of intercity buses for a lot of its movements. It also includes these other aspects of machineries and mining equipment and heavy duty vehicles within that strategy with timeframes going from 2035 to 2045. Now, one of the mentions, one of the things that I mentioned previously is the importance of using public tenders or public uh, pub public procurement efforts to introduce new vehicle technologies. In this case, battery electric vehicles. And one thing that is important to note is that this sometimes requires changes in the way that traditional transport or public transport models have worked. So going here to what you know normal operations look like or traditional uh, models work, uh, and this is the way that Santiago operated until most recently, we had one operator that was basically in charge of not only securing capital investments for the acquisition of both equipment and buses for the operation, but also in charge of all aspects of operation of the buses. And the uh, government in this case was only in charge of financing that scheme, either through taxes, tariffs, or subsidies that were collected onto the population. Now, what we're seeing now, and this is very important, is a move towards reducing the risk of operators in the system. And why? Because what happens is that when we have an operator that is in charge of 
not only financing, but the technology implementation and the, disp the, the disposition of the fleet, we increase the chances for failure as all of that pressure is laid upon one actor. And what we want to do is try to reduce that risk or better distribute that risk so that we can ensure that new procurements can be made, more expensive procurements in terms of capital can be made, although operationally it could be more, more it, it could be cheaper, but it's important to be able to include that in the process, or that's something that we're moving towards to be able to reduce this risk and the better and make a better distribution of the risk. So what we're doing here is separating um, the, the operation from the rest of the aspects that have to do with the public transportation system. And what we want to do here is have the operator in charge of operations, but have a third party in charge of the of the of the of the provision of the fleet and being the owner of all those assets that are included in the operation. And what does that look like or what does that translate to? It translates to a system where you have different actors assuming different levels of risk and that also leads to a less likelihood of failure by being able to properly finance these schemes, distribute risk accordingly and also incentivize the deployment of battery electric buses. And this is something that we've done through basically leasing contracts. And these contracts allow just the for this new introduction of new financial actors, new proprietary actors that are involved in the financing of these schemes, and also to have, for example, different sorts of trust funds that are included that allow for channeling investments, tariffs, subsidies to the different actors that are needed to support the public transportation system. And this is something that we've seen being cons consolidated in Chile. And so, for example, in the latest tender that I was mentioning earlier in 2019, we changed the business model of the public transportation system here in Chile to be able to better distribute that risk and also to create different incentives for the introduction of battery electric buses. And this was also done because in the first case, we had one of the operators that was in risk of bankruptcy. And it was very difficult to be able to deal with a circumstance where you had an operator that basically was in charge of more than 1,000 buses in the city to go bankrupt. And so what we did in the new business model is have basically two different tenders, one for bus operators and another for fleet providers. And in this sense, distribute that risk accordingly. Another thing that we did that was very important is change uh, the ownership of the bus depots, whereas before they were owned by the operators, the private operators, in order to introduce, introduce new operators, this was a very important barrier. And what the government did is expropriate these terminals, these depots, in order to secure that one, that ownership would remain within the state, and two, being able to change operators if need be without having, you know, uh, the excessive risk of failure in the system. And so the new tenders that were conducted were both, were two separate tenders, one for bus operators, where if the provision of the fleet, sorry, if the bus operators chose to operate their fleet with electric buses, they would be granted a contract of seven years, extendable by another seven years. However, if they chose diesel buses, they would get a contract of five years, extendable by another five years. And the same for fleet providers. If the fleets provided where with diesel, uh, with, with diesel propulsion, they would get a contract for 10 years, whereas if they were providing electric buses, you would get a contract for 14 years. And what this does is basically change the way that everything is working in the city. It, it, everything is working in the country right now with the new provision of, of buses that has this new distribution of, of, uh, uh, of risk, but also ownership within the city. Finally, now we have chosen to move towards a different system to consolidate 
what we have already been doing, but also reduce the administrative burden of conducting two separate tenders, as we see here. And now we're moving towards a system where we have only one tender for bus operators that it, then they have to negotiate by themselves the fleet provision for those operations. Now, this new business model has a number of different improvements, including the separation from investment of investment from operation. It also creates facilities for operational continuity by decreasing the number of units that each service has. You know, previously we had operators running a thousand buses. Now at the most we'll have operators running between 350 and 400 buses. It's also a more competitive system because now the bus depots are not a barrier of entry for new operators and that allows for more competition, more dif different actors to enter the system. It, improves, you know, it also improves the fleet standard by requiring more stringent quality measures, but also new technologies are entering the system that are more sustainable. And finally, it aims to reduce the overall cost of the public transportation system as we've previously seen. It also includes a number of subsidies that are very important uh, to the system and that also creates a burden to um, the, fiscal, um, the fiscal balance of the government. Finally, and something that is very important to include as well, is that we've included different sorts of measures within the tender to also cover other aspects of uh, this transition towards a more equitable public transportation system. And that includes not only different certifications for road safety, but also increasing um, the, jet, the participation of females in the workforce, not only as drivers, but also as technical staff within the, the operators and also included provisions to improve the paid zones where buses are taking to reduce uh, the evasion costs that um, are being that are that are notable here in Santiago and finally and one thing that is very important is that for all electric buses all of these are required to have a sub, an energy supply contract and these energy supply contracts have to be certified as coming from renewable energy. So all the buses in Santiago, all the electric buses are running on renewable energy and that also closes the loop in terms of a sustainable transport system in terms of technology and energy sources. Finally, some conclusions uh, regarding battery electric buses and some of the lessons that we've learned from these scale deployments in Santiago de Chile and other cities in Latin America and the Caribbean where we worked. And these include the importance of innovating in terms of policies. Uh, it's important to innovate uh, in terms of the policy environment to be able to attract new actors to the sector, but also to reduce the risks that we've seen have been traditionally placed on different actors. And it's important to be able to innovate in policy to be able to drive these new technologies uh, into the sector. And this opportunity has to also come with an increase in quality of the service because what we want to do is also not only introduce new technologies but also spur more interest in the public transportation system and that includes increasing the quality of those operations for the citizens that are using or preferring that system over private modes of transportation for example. Um, it's also crucial to innovate in the financial model as we've seen without those innovations it's impossible to be able to attract new actors into the system and that can bring new sources of capital uh, for uh, investments in the sector and it's also important to work on uh, creating uh, new data sources and sources of information that can reduce the asymmetries of information uh, between the government and the private actors and also um, for operators in terms of how this technology is going to look like in the future and what are the potential costs that, are, uh, that, that may in turn uh, fall onto them as, for example, battery capacities decrease, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Another aspect that has been crucial here in Chile is that we've used public transportation as the main 
uh, point of entry for electric mobility in the country. And as I mentioned, there's a number of positive externalities in doing so, but it's very important to also acknowledge that most of the people still, most of the people that are moving in the city are using public transportation. So it's important to incentivize that mode and incentivize that mode uh, also includes providing better quality of service, but also newer and cleaner technologies. And finally, it's impossible to do this without a very solid and strong enabling environment for these technologies because it, it's not only one, two or three actors that are involved, but it's a whole ecosystem of opportunities and actors that are involved in transitioning towards the system. So with that, I wanna conclude uh, my presentation. Uh, please feel free to email me at any time regarding any questions. And uh, I wish you all the best in your own transition towards electric public transportation in Morocco. Thank you very much. Goodbye.